Hello, how are you guys doing? Great. All right, so I had to think of a keynote topic and thought, what is something that I uniquely know? And the answer is, I've been a core developer for 16 years, or just coming up on uh, 16 years now. And so I could give you an insight into that world. So I've organized this into a, a handful of parts. One part is I just want to tell you some uh, uh, anecdotes and stories from core developer world, uh, uh, some which I'm hoping will be a little bit amusing. Then I'll tell you some of the facts of life in, uh, in that world and invite you into it and give you some advice for coming into it and how to uh, participate. And uh, how many of you know what I do for a living right now? I teach Python. And you know, the problem with being a teacher is you can't turn it off, which means that there's lessons in here. And then after the lessons, there's a test. <laughs> I'm not kidding. The back half of the presentation is a case study, a series of uh, case studies. And the answers to the case studies are being given in advance. So all the parts that seem like little breezy points, we'll see if you've uh, learned them all. There's a test at the end. Fair enough? All right, uh, I'm Raymond Hedinger. This is my uh, Twitter account, uh, Raymond H. I don't tweet when I get off of an airplane or see a cool movie. I tweet about Python. I teach Python through Twitter. And so I hope you guys follow, if only to learn a little bit more about uh, the language. Uh, thank you for inviting me uh, to this conference. Thank you for the, uh, the sponsors who put this together. Uh, Microsoft was uh, amazing in providing a space yesterday for the tutorial. Uh, we're very, very lucky to uh, have had these facilities. So uh, anecdotes, uh, some stories about uh, my life in uh, open source, just uh, uh, some amusing times. It all started with uh, OSCON, at least the speaking part of my role, about uh, seven years ago. I spoke to an audience that had maybe about 15 uh, people in it. Alex was in that uh, uh, audience, so was uh, Quido Van Rossum. So were several friends that I knew. I knew half of the people in the audience. Do you think that helped? It did not. I shook the whole time. Mortal fear. A few months later, I uh, went to EuroPyCon, and I gave a five-minute lightning talk. No pressure, right? It's only five minutes. I shook the whole time and almost uh, uh, froze. Just a mortal fear of public speaking. That was a few years ago. I've gotten over it. <laughs> OK. Once upon a time, I boarded a, a train in uh, Shanghai. If, uh, one of the nice things about the Python world is it's very large. I got invited to uh, teach a class over there. And one of the things I like to do when I travel is uh, get on the public transportation, go around, explore myself, and uh, I not see the tourist side of the world, but just see the rest of the world. So it's a simple thing. And everywhere you go, you get on the public transportation, and you learn something about how the people live there and whatnot. And so it's a simple thing. I walk out. There's a train pointing into uh, downtown uh, uh, Shanghai. It has a bunch of uh, Chinese characters on it, which surely meant going to downtown Shanghai. <laughs> I got on the train. The door closed. Everything's normal so far. And then the train did something interesting. It made a turn and left Shanghai. Now keep in mind, I couldn't read anything that was on there. Now Shanghai's getting further and further away. Many places in the world I go, English will get you by in sign language, not Shanghai. Uh, I was kind of in trouble. There was a chance that uh, I was going to never be seen or heard from ever again. I start looking around, looking for resources, and then I see it. At the end of the train, there is a young man who has a book in his hand, Alex Martelli's Python cookbook. <laughs> I walked over to this person, opened up the book. It's around chapter 18, and Alex invited me to write uh, one or two chapters in that book, opened it up, pointed at my name, and said, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> I made a new friend. Uh, there's two Chinese symbols I used to be able to write. Uh, he taught me uh, for, and it translates roughly to famous person. <laughs> Became my new best friend, took me into uh, downtown Shanghai, showed me all around, and uh, guess who got uh, some free Python lessons and advice and code reviews and whatnot, and uh, thanks for saving me from being lost in uh, China. So the Python world is actually a very, very large and interesting. And thank you, Alex. You saved me from being lost in China. All right. Another experience. I went to uh, 
Uh, PyCon, there's lots of them now, and they're fairly big. Uh, this one might not seem huge to you, but this was about the size of Python conferences not that many years ago. And I can't remember which, exactly which one. It might have been the first one in Dallas, uh, which was not much bigger than this. And I went to uh, uh, one of the talks, and there was a fellow named uh, Jim Baker, and he was giving a Python uh, talk on the iter tools module and all kinds of ways to use it and how awesome it was. And that was a wonderful experience for me. I had never gone to a talk listening to somebody talk about something that I had made before. And it's a heady experience. Uh, I don't know if there's any lesson in that. It's just the first time you sit there and hear somebody give a talk, authoritative talk, on something you wrote. You're just, wow, this is cool. And then every now and then you learn something new. It's like, I didn't know that, <laughs> uh, which is astonishing. Peter Norvig, a personal hero. I have this thought of uh, if you would like to improve your intelligence, improve uh, your smarts, all you have to do is say Peter Norvig's name, and your IQ points go up a few points. Uh, uh, seriously, I believe if you read basically anything that he's ever published, uh, it improves your skills quite a bit. And he has a fair number of uh, uh, works on uh, Python. And so I have uh, one of his more recent ones on uh, probability. I took a look at it, and substantially everything in it used uh, tools that I wrote, which was a big deal for me, obviously. Wow. Peter uses my stuff to express ideas. This is uh, uh, really cool. <sighs> Isn't it great when somebody uses your stuff to do something interesting? Yeah. Oh, you might think. Before I became a core developer, I published a, uh, a module. Uh, I wanted to use something like NumPy, uh, but I was a Windows programmer at the time, didn't have uh, access to a C compiler and Fortran compiler. I needed to uh, uh, build it. There was not good distribution tools at the time. And so if you need a matrix package and you don't have one, what do you do? You're a computer programmer. What do you do? <laughs> you write a computer program. So I wrote uh, matfunk.py. And this was my first big package. And I tried to be very careful. I put footnotes all, all throughout for every algorithm where I got it uh, from, which textbook it came from. I tried to research the best approaches to each problem, make very clean code, and uh, uh, test it and put in preconditions and postconditions and whatnot, and wrote up a really nice document. Fancied myself as kind of a you know, pseudo academic with a little paper uh, around it. And I put it on my personal website. And the interesting thing about websites at the time was uh, analytics were fairly rare at that point. And if you put something on the website, you have no idea if anybody is even looking at stuff you put up. Uh, the experience at the time of having a personal website was stepping into a dark room and talking and telling jokes, <laughs> describing things that you know, and there's complete silence in the room. Unless one day you say something to this dark room, and all of a sudden you hear a lot of applause. And that's the only way that you would know that you uh, uh, had any users. So I put up uh, this package, and I got no feedback at all, just saying, for two years. Then I got one email. It was from CERN. <laughs> and it was a feature request. <laughs> and uh, along with this feature request, they just put in there, everybody at CERN is using matfunk.py. We love uh, Python. I was like, for God's sakes, don't use this for anything nuclear. <laughs> 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 this is my first package. <laughs> I'm at the outer limits of my mathematical knowledge putting this thing uh, together. <laughs> anyway, that one scared the bejesus out of me. <laughs> Uh, went to another uh, Python conference at one point, and there's lots of swag, and uh, uh, people are giving out t-shirts and whatnot, and every now and then I will see a t-shirt, and it has some code on it, and the code has something I wrote, which feels kind of cool. So uh, I now walk up to people and say, I wrote that code, and then they give me a t-shirt. Uh, so I've got a nice collection of them, which raises the question, what do you do with all of these uh, t-shirts? Who knows the best answer? Make a quilt is, in fact, the right answer. And that was, uh, Lynn, was it Lynn Root? Oh, you don't know. This has been done. Uh, so I thought you were, uh, uh, so I think, I think it was uh, Lynn Root just collected together all of her t-shirts from all the conferences she's been to, and she made a quilt out of it. Uh, so you independently came up with that rather than, yes, it's the right answer. All right. 
And then uh, cool things, being invited all around the uh, world. I gave a talk and uh, a keynote in uh, Pune, India, which was uh, really cool. I went out, there was a thousand people in the audience. I had never seen any of these folks before. I pound on the table. <clears throat> what did they say? <laughs> the meme made it all the way to uh, India, which is a fantastic uh, uh, thing. And they're like, would you like to give a keynote in Moscow? I'm like, sure, I'll go to Moscow and stay there for a while and take my family uh, with me and we'll travel uh, all through uh, Russia. And so that was an adventure afforded to me uh, through the Python uh, world. Uh, other aspects of the Python world. At one time, we had a mailing list, uh, a Python uh, a tutor list, and that's still available. And the Python tutor list is a way where people help each other out and it's famous for being very kind and friendly. There's a disadvantage to it, of it though, and that all of your posts are public. What if you need some private and one-on-one -on -one help and uh, coaching? We had a separate mail list for that. It was Python help. And so Python help, someone could send it to an individual, a note to an individual core developer and get individual help. And so we took turns manning the uh, uh, help desk and got notes from people all around the world and would help them uh, uh, with their problems. Now, different things can come out of this depending on w uh, what your shift is for the uh, uh, help desk and a matter of uh, luck. So let's see what kind of things can come to you out of uh, being on the help desk. You could be, let's say, Alex Martelli. You're manning the help desk. Anna Ravenscroft uh, sends you an email. You send her an email back. She sends you an email back. You send her an email back. Next thing you know, you're uh, at your wedding. They're reading a, a Zen of Python. That's what happens when Alex mans the uh, 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 help desk. Mine, the very first one I got was, my Python has six eggs. At what temperature do I keep the eggs in order to get them to hatch? At which point I have to refer them to the herpetology uh, uh, news group. Alex gets a wife, I get Python eggs. Just saying. <laughs> So that's how it rolls. And those are adventures from uh, Python land. I just thought I'd share uh, uh, some of the little ups and downs and fun parts in the uh, uh, history. Does it sound cool, all of the uh, delicious perks of being a Python core developer? Woo! Yeah, good news. We're hiring. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know how to write employment ads, so I just took a look at the ads that are currently being posted, and I thought, you know, hey, I'll use these as a model, so I'll tell you a little bit about what we're looking for. <laughs> diverse developers wanted. If you're diverse, we want you. If you're not diverse, we want you. In fact, we'll take anybody. <laughs> the attraction to the company. Come build software that changes the world. That was not the original attraction, because when I joined Python, it wasn't that popular. Uh, not that popular at all. In fact, I first heard about Python when I was uh, taking a MATLAB class in uh, uh, Natick, uh, uh, Massachusetts, and one of my classmates uh, mentioned it to me. You can work from home on a distributed collaborative team. Pretty nice. Uh -huh. And this is the best part. Lots of companies have rules, but we don't. You can work as many hours as you want, and nobody will make you stop. Now, some companies, uh, you join the company, you want to work on exciting Project X, but they need to get something else out the door, and they shift you to the project that's no fun. For us, you can choose any of the projects on Python that you want to work on. If you uh, uh, want to work on the element tree package, why, you can just go right ahead. Isn't that great? Free to choose. You work from home as many hours as you want, and the best part is the pay. I have been there 16 years, and my salary has doubled every single year, and I can promise the same for you. Well, there was one time where I stepped on Quito's toes and he cut my salary in half that year, but I eventually got over it and I'm back up to where I was before. Just saying. How's that for a job ad? All right, it's funny, but it's actually all true, all of it. Which raises the question, what can you do? Uh, uh, if you want to participate in uh, Python core development. Do I even recommend that you become a Python uh, core developer? No. It is not the greatest uh, uh, job. Uh, it is uh, thankless. It pays very little. It can consume inordinate amounts of your time. And a lot of times, it's not particularly uh, uh, fun. And if you want to change the world, if you want to get your code out there and whatnot, the best thing you can do is join a project that uses Python. 
those projects need you. Python uh, core is fairly mature uh, uh, source, and so you're going to find that in a mature uh, code base, almost everything you touch, almost every idea you have might make it worse in some way. And yet, if you get your experience on another project, one that needs you, almost every idea you have will improve the project. And you can be a lot more productive at the outset and then move to something like the Python core. So I don't think it's a particularly good place to start. It's a fairly complicated uh, uh, code, code base. Uh, it's enormous. Do you think if you studied it 16 years, you might know it all? How about 26 years? Who studied the Python code base for 26 years? Creator Van Rossum. The person who wrote it. He uses Python every day. He oversees its uh, uh, development. He speaks about it. He makes his living doing Python. Do you think he knows it pretty well? It is my belief that he knows less than 1% of what's going on in the Python world. It is my belief that uh, uh, he has seen less than 25% of the code in the uh, uh, core. It is bigger than any one human being can uh, 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 fully comprehend. The rate of, uh, if you looked at my emails, it'd be insane. You would see on the order of 15,000 emails a month that are uh, uh, Python related. I, can, I track every Python check-in. I read every uh, uh, post to the uh, bug tracker. I used to read Python dev all the time until people started talking too much. Uh, and that's a bit of a joke at the same time. When some chatty and happy people joined Python dev, it rendered the channel unusable. The uh, number of emails went up by about a factor of five uh, in a short period of time, at which point you just can't devote two hours a day to reading just one mail list. Uh, you actually have to go out and do some work, and it's better to read the uh, uh, bug tracker. And so there's an, uh, uh, Quido himself does not follow all of the uh, posts on the bug tracker. He does follow Python dev, but he can't even follow all of the uh, check-ins. Is it any bigger than any one uh, human being can comprehend? In fact, it is, so we need your help. Here's some things that you can do oh, if you wanted to help. The element tree package doesn't have uh, doc strings in it. Is that a pretty easy thing to do? Sure. What do you need to do? Go get good at element tree. Work with it a little bit. Look at some uh, uh, published code. Read the documentation. Think about it. Come to understand it deeply. And then try and translate the documentation into good doc strings. With some effort, that is something that pretty much anyone in this room can do, and it would instantly make Python better and more usable, particularly for people who use uh, Iron, uh, IPython. Uh, they really rely on this help rather than the uh, published uh, uh, documentation. Another thing you can do. Suppose you have a lot of free time, you're an amazingly good C programmer, and you don't have any social life whatsoever, and you're trying to think, how can I eat up all of my time? Are all of you in that situation? OK. Suppose you had about a week, week and a half. What you could do is there's a patch out there right now uh, on this issue for a compact dictionary. It will make Python better. The uh, uh, dictionaries will be smaller than our current dictionaries. They will iterate much faster. The patch is ready. It has tests. It has timings. It's a clean patch. It's a good patch by somebody who put a lot of effort into this, and it's modeled after something successful, the compact dict that is in PyPy that was based on a proof of concept code that uh, I published on uh, somewhere at one point. Uh, in fact, they were initially calling it the Raymond dict. Uh, the name did not uh, uh, stick. Compact dict is a better name for it. So is it ready to go? Oh, the code needs to be reviewed. Somebody has to do it. Somebody had to, you see. And I picked somebody. Uh, I don't know how to make this part rhyme. We, we read a lot of Dr. Seuss at my house. <laughs> OK. And so how did it go, Rachel? She doesn't remember now. <laughs> oh, so uh, uh, somebody had to, somebody had to, you see. So my uh, mom will pick somebody, Sally and me. Okay, and I'm uh, picking uh, you and uh, Sally to go review the compact dict. It is not an easy thing. It changes a lot of code. Each of the lines might have a profound implication for performance or security in uh, uh, Python. It is an easy thing to get wrong. It really needs to be reviewed even though it's good. If you were to review it, we can put it in. Possibly we could put it into Python 3.6. But right now, not uh, any of us has the uh, spare clock cycles to put in uh, the amount of effort that it uh, is going to take. 
that's something you could do right away. When people become Python core developers, often they want to put new stuff in Python. Really, what they should be doing is taking the existing stuff and making it better. Uh, the place where I believe the language is most efficient is in the quality of error messages. I notice this a lot because I teach Python, and people get error messages that are nonsensical to them. It doesn't say, you made this mistake. Here's what I really wanted. Here's what you probably meant. Go do this. It'll fix it. Those are really helpful error messages. Unhelpful error messages is, I expected a buffer object. I refused to do the action that you uh, requested. <laughs> we have lots of error messages like that. Getting those fixed is not a matter of just changing the text. A lot of them, you have to be able to analyze the context that the error happened in and uh, understand where the users can go wrong. Uh, one of the things that the uh, experienced Python core developers have a uh, hard time with is we are so used to using the language correctly it becomes fairly difficult over time to conceive of people's profoundly different mental models of what they would do to uh, wreck it and get it into a bad situation. So it's almost hard to conceive at the time if you're writing something, what is a really good error message to put in? That said, a lot of you are in a position to be able to come up with those things. If you find something that is hazardous to someone's health, error message-wise, submit a patch. It's very welcome. Idle. Uh, has the letters I, D, and E in it because it's an IDE. It's actually named for Eric Idle from uh, Monty Python's uh, A Flying Circus. It is not the world's greatest editor. It crashes. It has performance problems. And yet a lot of people use it because it ships with Python. Here's what we can do. A, teach people Python on Idle and then tell them, go get yourself a real editor. Or B, we could turn idle into a real editor. Most of the people in this room are capable of helping uh, uh, do that project. I say make it awesome. Another thing you can do is just weigh in on whether proposals are good or bad. A lot of people think that uh, contributing to the Python core has a lot to do with writing patches. I don't think so. I think the patches are the least important part. Uh, we'll talk about some of those in the uh, case study. An example uh, uh, for, for uh, the current moment is in the random module, there's a function called choice. And what it does is take out of a population and chooses an element randomly. I have a population of people in this room, random choice, choose one of them. The proposal is, let's make a weighted choice uh, so that the people in this half of the room have twice the uh, chance of getting uh, selected as people on this part of, uh, of the room. Fair enough. Or in the Hunger Games, the older you get, the more lottery tickets you have inside to get chosen for uh, the games, a lottery you don't want to win, unless it's to save your little sister. And you get a chance to shoot at people with a bow and arrow. OK. All right, that's somewhere else. So uh, you can weigh in on uh, proposals like that. How could you participate in that? Could you write me a patch for it? No, I don't want a patch. Why not? The answer is, I believe most people in this room are capable of writing that function. And quickly, most of you could knock something out in five minutes. In 15 minutes, you could make something fairly good looking. In an hour, you could make something good looking, good variable names, nice doc string, doc patch, and uh, uh, test cases. Any of us can do it. And because any of us can do it quickly, it suggests that there's, that's not where the worth is. I'd like you to do the hard part. I'd like you to help me with the hard part. The hard part is not making that patch. Any of us could do that. That's effortless. What is the hard part? The hard part is, what is the right API for it? Should it return a generator? Well, that would be kind of cool. It would run really fast, but nothing else in the random module looks like that. So it's non-harmonious with the rest of uh, uh, the module. How many of you use the random module all the time? How many of you uh, do data science? Okay. How many of you know how to uh, do Bayesian Monte Carlo simulations using the random module? <laughs> All right. You folks matter. You matter a lot because a lot of folks who've uh, tried to participate in this have essentially no mathematical background at all. In other words, they are quite far divorced from the people who actually use this. So it's pretty easy for them to design a crap API. I know. We'll pass in a dictionary that has the population as the keys and the weights as a value. Well, this is great. Do you think somebody out there might have uh, some population members that aren't hashable? 
That's a, uh, a, a problem. Do you think data arrives in the form of a dictionary? Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. If you hand enter a, a ex, uh, quick uh, toy example, it might be effortless. It might be that the norm is that uh, the population and the weights arrive separately. It might be that the norm is you rerun with the same population many different times, but with uh, different weights. I don't know what that norm is, nor do most of the other people who participated in this uh, discussion. You guys know the answers uh, to those questions. Go out and look at actual use cases. Talk to people who are applied mathematicians, statisticians, and uh, data scientists. Get their input for it. Take some use cases. Take 10 different variants of the API and try those use cases with them and see which one fits the best. That's useful. That's something any of you can do, and you don't have to know a lot of Python uh, to do it. And that will make Python better. Uh, one of the challenges of the uh, standard library is if we put something in, it becomes standard by definition, which means it's really hard to change. A lot of people rely on it. And so if you put in something with a bad API, we have to live with it for all eternity. You wouldn't want that, would you? That would be a terrible thing. All right, so uh, this is a call to action. People are often saying, what can I, what can I do? Here are some specific things you can do, concluding uh, uh, on issue numbers, so that you could go chime in right now. Jessica, last night, made a nice call to action. She said, learn the rules of the game, use those rules to go change the game and improve the world. I'm showing you the rules of our game, and I'm giving you an on-ramp point so that you can join and go help change the world. And next time you're stuck in China, you can go to a book and point inside at your name and say, I wrote that. Fair enough? Or better yet, I designed that. All right. So let's go work on your management skills. Uh, I was uh, reviewing a book by uh, uh, Kenneth Wrights. It's actually a community book, but uh, he's the uh, lead author on it. It's uh, Hitchhiker's Guide to uh, Python. And this jumped out right at the beginning. I thought I would uh, uh, share it with you. It's a variation of the Spider-Man rule that says, with great power comes great responsibility. A real Pythonista knows how to write meta classes and decorators and all kinds of Python foo. And once in a while, we use it to take a deadly problem and we smack it down using these advanced tools. The other 99.99% .99 of the time, if you're a real Pythonista, you don't whip out all of these tools. You use for loops, you use a simple class, uh, you code in the normal way, and don't do anything exotic. And one of our problems is, has been some of our more recent core developers got to the point where they knew, uh, knew Kung Fu. Then they joined the Python core development team and they started using it, not on important problems, but on small problems. So I'm going to pick on uh, one uh, that is, this is me just being a little opinionated, but it'll uh, share with you a thought of ways I think that our development process can go wrong. So, a person joined the Python core, and it's not just one person, it was a, uh, I'll just say there's a group of people involved here, and all of them knew how to do the Kung Fu. Now we have a small problem, a very small problem. The very small problem is this. If you def uh, define a, uh, a constant in uh, a Python, red is equal to one, and later you print out red it shows as the number one, not as the word red. How catastrophic of a problem is this? Well, Python got by 24 years without addressing uh, uh, this problem. Once in a while, people would set red equal to the string red, and it would work just fine. There were many solutions to the problem, but in other languages, we have enum. So you see other languages have enum. You come to Python, you see this problem. It's logical to uh, put those two concepts together and say lots of other languages have one. We have this problem. It's an actual real problem. We should put the two together. Now you whip out your kung fu, and you put together an enum class. The enum class, remember, the problem it solves is it makes the word red print out as color.red instead of as one. That's the only problem it solves. Involve, if you were to go look at the source code for uh, enum, it's got meta classes in it. It's got descriptors. It's got hooks on uh, set attribute. It has pretty much every trick in the book that I teach in advanced Python uh, uh, classes. And that's an insane amount of firepower at a small problem. Mo uh, languages that have an enum mostly only have one. They just say, here's how you do an enum. 
we've got two variants, but inside the documentation, there's another uh, 10 variants, and another one almost made it in this week. I shouldn't say almost made it in, it got, uh, it got in this week. I'll show it to you in our case study section in a few minutes. And uh, I had some success, and last night, the uh, developer really stepped up to the plate. It's a, if you think it's an act of courage to check in code, it's a bigger act of courage to acknowledge maybe this wasn't such a good idea and pull it out just before a release. And that happened uh, just last night. So uh, I applaud the developer for their courage in saying, whoops, that was a bridge too far. Fair enough? All right, so uh, I think this is fairly important in our world. Uh, it is quite different when you're developing tools that use Python because you can make mistakes and undo them later, but if you put them in the Python core, it tends to be hard to undo. Fair enough? Anyway, that's uh, Ken, uh, Kenneth's thoughts on some. Do you guys know who Kenneth Reitz is? Author of the request module, Python superstar. Okay, fair enough. All right, some advice on if you start to participate in our world. Be a good neighbor. This is actually harder than it sounds because you step into the Python world and you want to start to participate. And you're like, there's a flower garden. I should go step in that flower garden and rearrange all of the flowers and trample a few of them. There, I'm contributing. Some of those flower gardens are carefully maintained by people who only participate because they like how their flower garden looks and it works perfectly for a set of people. And if you were to go rearrange the uh, flowers, even if you make an improvement to the flower bed, possibly you've completely undermined somebody's motivation for participating. An example would be the uh, JSON module. The uh, core developer who submitted that, uh, who originally wrote simple JSON and then do uh, donated it to uh, a Python, had a very clear worldview of what it was supposed to do. Had a very large user base that was very happy uh, with it. It's not particularly active. Suppose you join the Python core and go in and say, oh, I think the JSON module should do something differently. Now keep in mind, this person has a job, very little spare time, and you go in and rearrange all their code. Even if you improve the JSON module a little bit, what do you think it you did about that, uh, the effect that you had on that person's willingness to maintain that module in the future? So in fact, that is the thing that has happened, is periodically people come in, and in just trying to help, they stamp step on other people's flower gardens. Fair enough. All right, uh, another related concept here. I'm trying to think of some way to get rid of this terrible, entirely uh, inappropriate joke, but I will uh, just go for it. It was one that I heard as a kid. How many of you have ever heard Helen Keller jokes? Okay, so you already know it's going to be uh, uh, tasteless. What did Helen Keller's uh, parents do when they were mad at her? The answer is they would rearrange the furniture in the house. Isn't that terrible? So in fact, that would be a mean and cruel thing to do. You would never do that, would you? Would you ever refactor code that's not yours? You're doing exactly that. We've all been taught that refactoring is good. And in fact, it is mostly a good thing. But I want to uh, suggest an alternative uh, point of view uh, that I've arrived at after a lot of thought and a lot of year, years of, of work and I finally think I figured out the core issue with some types of refactoring. I took a, uh, read a book on improving your memory and a technique that is very old is called the method of loci. Uh, the, uh, and so the uh, Greek and Roman orators would take the parts of their speeches and memorize them by associating each part of the speech with a section of a house or a walk through a city. And then to uh, play it back in their mind, they mentally redo the walk. It occurred to me later, the significance of this is our minds have an enormous chunk of our brain is uh, set aside for spatial reasoning. I uh, thought about putting an example up here of taking some code you were unfamiliar with and laying it all out on the screen in boxes and saying, now this piece on the left calls this one on the right. The one on the bottom loops back in, and the, uh, this one on the bottom right uh, zings in and out several times, and it's just a support function, but once in a while we swap all of this up and this piece becomes dominant. And then my intent was to take that code, explain it to you, but use words very much like the words I just used. Then I would ask, does everybody in the room understand the code? And my goal was to get you to understand that code. Then I'm going to show you an improvement to the code where somebody comes in and refactors it. And that refactoring changed the structure, the organization of the code, and moves it around. 
I'm asking you to come back to the code that you've invested time to understand and say, can you manipulate it? Do you understand it now without reinvesting uh, new time? And the answer is often no. And so I worked uh, at a company once where we had a refactorer, um, a, a nut. And refactoring is general good, but his thought was, as I go to understand code that I haven't seen before, what I'll do is just constantly rearrange it in a way that makes sense to me. Oh, well, these are related thoughts, so I'll move them together. And the problem is, it was very effective for this person. It was great for them because at the end, they completely understood the code. They touched it, they moved around, uh, organized it to their way of thinking. But in their wake, not a single person who had ever worked on that code knew where anything was anymore. And when you rearrange it, it becomes that Helen Keller joke. I mention that because we have a core developer right now who has an insane amount of time on their hands. In, a, insane. And is spending a lot of time, it's, they don't have any external projects that they maintain or whatnot. I don't know that they've ever met a user ever. ever. The person is a very, very good programmer, a C programmer, and they're refactoring things in Python. Lots of them. Uh, I think if we give this person another year, half of the code base will have been touched and rearranged. Oh, I saw this thing mentioned uh, a couple times. We should put a macro in and invents a brand new macro. <laughs> Uh, you know, this thing was used twice in one place. We'll pull this code out. Each one of those things individually is fine. Collectively, the entire code base is becoming unrecognizable to the people who made that code who have less time to contribute uh, as we're going on. So when I say don't trample in other people's flower gardens, I'm saying that it's possible to come in being very enthusiastic, make actually things that are individually improvements, and to actually destroy the whole community. You wouldn't want to do that, would you? That'd be, you're not a flower garden trampler? No, and uh, you wouldn't rearrange uh, Helen Keller's uh, furniture? No. Fair enough. So you're not going to go in and take all of my code and refactor it just because it looks a little nicer to you? Only Which she would, <laughs> as I know how, how she is. All right, picture straighteners. You walk by, a picture's crooked. What do you do? Straighten it. We all have a little OCD in us as uh, programmers, because if you don't, your code ends up looking like a garbage pile. Are any of you in the uh, networking world? Yeah, so in the networking world, it's very interesting. You walk by uh, somebody's uh, data center and you see this giant rat's nest of ethernet cable uh, going all over the place. Anybody ever seen something like that? How confident are you in that uh, person's setup? It's indicative of how those people think, how they organize, how they clean uh, uh, things up, how they uh, uh, plan and how they maintain. When you see that rat's nest, it's a warning sign. So when you go into a data center where all the cables are nice and neat and they all go to specific spots and they have nice color codes and it, it gives you a great deal uh, uh, more confidence. Fair enough? So if you're a decent programmer, you tend to be a picture, uh, a picture straightener because you like things to be a little bit neater because they're easier to reason about. Fair enough? On the other hand, what if you go around straightening other people's pictures all the time without looking at the photo? That's actually quite uh, common in the Python world. Lots of people come look at the Python courts. Oh, I'm going to just change this code. This would be a little bit better this way. And I'd like to give you an example of uh, me being victimized by a picture, a picture straightener. Okay. And I'm not picking on people here. I'm, I'm suggesting ways to be effective in uh, big projects and mature projects. Everything I'm saying here would apply uh, to Linux uh, as, as well. You go join the Linux kernel and you go rearrange all the code. You will destroy that project. And if you go straight in all the pictures like this, you can possibly muck up Linux in a fairly big way. So uh, I actually have this on a separate slide. That's... All right. So I had a, uh, a test in uh, test sets. And what it said was uh, assert true that set A is less than or equal to set B. Easy enough, and the uh, assertion passed. What happened is a picture straightener came by and said, long after I wrote this test, some uh, new specific asserts were added to the unit test module. So everywhere you said A is less than or equal to B, there is now an assertion for it that says assert less than. Okay? And so, uh, the motivation for this is if we, you assert true A is less than B and you get an error message, all it says is this is false. But if you have an assert, uh, self-assert less than, what it can do is actually show you the two values and give you a more helpful error message when it falls through. So does it make sense that we sometimes change 
a less than test to a self-assert uh, less than. That's the motivation. But the person didn't look at my picture or understand what I was trying to do at the time. What did they come through and do? There, uh, that test was not testing less than. In sets, less than equal means a subset test. And so these words are now the wrong words. The error message is now the wrong error message. And it came up in a midst of a whole bunch of tests in a section where I was testing operators. I didn't even want to test subsettiness. I wanted to make sure the less than equal operator actually works. So this test uh, now no longer does what I expected it to do. Now keep in mind that this is the person who I mentioned earlier who has a lot of time on their hands. They didn't do this once. They've uh, easily changed on the order of five, uh, 6,000 tests in the uh, standard library going through and making them into specific asserts. They believe that they have made it uh, uh, better, but in fact, uh, uh, far worse. And so I don't want to pick on that particular case as much as just say, when you come to a, uh, a, a big project, don't be a picture straightener. That doesn't help. Don't be a weirdo. <laughs> Python attracts weirdos, lots of them. And I'm not going to say that I'm not one of them. And it's actually OK to be a little bit weird. We encourage that even by the name of the language. But I'd like you to self-censor your ideas. If your ideas are just completely random, whatever junk popped into your mind, it shouldn't immediately show up on the uh, bug tracker as a, uh, a feature request. So do a little self-censorship. Try out your own idea and see if it actually makes an improvement. Run it past another uh, person. And so we have some people out there who don't self-censor, and they put in many, many, many feature requests. And my problem is I can't just shut them down because possibly one in a hundred of them is going to be a good idea. But it means that I am now in the role of censoring that person's thoughts, it's, uh, whereas most of you would actually say, is this idea actually good before you go suggest it? You remember Jessica McKellar's uh, first contribution to uh, Twisted, the one that she described yesterday? She said that she came, uh, she put so much thought into making sure it was perfect, that it complied with the, uh, the guy, that it was actually useful. Fewer than one proposer in a 1,000 that comes to the Python world did what uh, Jessica does. So uh, be Jessica. Don't be a weirdo. Don't talk too much on the mail list. The bandwidth is uh, finite. And don't rush to make a patch. It's the least important part. Uh, finding your way. Positive advice. Work on big problems, problems people actually uh, have. One of our challenges, as compared to other open source projects, is if you work on some specific tool, it's actually fairly well known in advance what problem that tool is uh, having. But a general purpose programming language can do anything. So we don't actually know in advance what problem we're solving. Because of that, uh, it's very easy to invent problems we don't have and create what my wife calls uh, swirling around. And so find big problems where people are actually out using Python, have a real problem, and the language isn't supporting it. And those tend to be very useful contributions. This is very important. Assume the people who came before you knew what they were doing. I came in the footsteps of people like Alex, and uh, Tim Peters, and Fred, uh, Friedrich Lund, uh, mental giants. And I had a great deal of respect for their code, and I learned for them. We have a new generation of core devs who presume that everyone who came before them was stupid and must have been wrong. And they just start changing their, their code. And if we're not there to take a look, it changes fairly rapidly. Spend a lot of time thinking. That is mostly uh, how you can contribute, is think about uh, uh, the world. And this is the hard part. You are an atypical uh, user if you are a core developer. In fact, other users have a profoundly different worldview. And you're not making Python for yourself. You're making it for other folks. And lastly, what is uh, the world of um, uh, being a Python core developer? It is a long journey to discover the zen and harmony of the language. It is a beautiful thing. It is successful for a reason. And as those of you who went to my tutorial learned, you know that that uh, zen goes very, very deeply, and that people after years are still discovering the internal harmony. Knowing that, we should recognize that uh, harmony is a very fragile thing. Take any song and randomly change a few notes, and you destroy the uh, song. It, uh, Python is quite fragile, and your random ideas could actually make it worse rather than uh, better. So treat all of this as a journey. Work on big problems. Assume the people who came before you were smart, and think a lot, and you can contribute a lot to our Python world. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, do we have room for uh, a few questions? How many? Uh, how many minutes? Oh. It was a trick question. <laughs> I, 
I did actually trick him on purpose. <laughs> I had some case studies I wanted to show you. Remember, I promised you uh, there would be a test. Let's take a look at uh, APIs in Python. In the string um, object, you can look for a substring, and you can tell it where to start and where to uh, in the uh, search. There's a legitimate use case for that. We do repeated indexed uh, uh, searches into code. Find also has that. What is missing from starts with and ends with? Let's see if you can pattern match. What is uh, not alike in these patterns? Start and end. Oh, one of these things is not like the other. What should we do? <laughs> Hypergeneralization was the hint to you, don't do this. We had no actual use case for it. No one had ever requested it. But instead, a new core dev comes along, sees four of these have start and end, and two of them don't. So they move this out down here. What is the consequence to you? At the time, there was no consequence. But later, we got an actual use case for something important. And that was that, what if you have multiple free prefixes or suffixes you want to scan, uh, scan for? .html, .css. Now we've got a problem. These other two positional arguments have been taken up. And so now, if you want multiple prefixes, you have to pass it in as a tuple, which always looks weird and it's always difficult to teach. This person put extra code in that we have to maintain that is not used by anyone and blocked actual useful things that we wanted to do. You're not going to be a hyper generalizer, are you? All right, enum. This is beautiful. How do you make a color? You can say, I want three enumerations, red, green, and blue. It looks like enum in almost every other language I've seen. Do you like it? It's a beautiful thing. There is no doubt about that. And it solves a problem that before this, you actually had to say red equal one, green equal two, and blue equal three, even if you weren't going to use those numbers. We have a problem. It's a small problem. A person has to do a little typing, typing in numbers. This went in. Is there any reason to undo it? This is a test to see if you're going to be any good at this. These are the decisions you face every day as a core dev, and they're easy to get wrong. There's something critically wrong with this. It took me a while to spot it. You guys have one minute. <laughs> What's that? OK, one thing that you notice is the property is a built-in. So it turns out that we have to pass in and ignore to it and tell it to ignore actual Python words in the class definition. That's a hint that you're going across the grain of the language, that you're fighting the language, and you're having to push the rest of the language out of the way. If you have to push the rest of the language out of the way, it's a hint that you're doing it wrong. So in fact, that's a hint. But notwithstanding that problem, there's a problem with this as well. Everywhere else in the Python world, if you have code like this in a class, it's an error. It's an error because you have a variable without an assignment to it. And what that variable normally does is it's an expression. An expression says, look up that variable. In this case, that writing the variable name, even when it doesn't already exist, creates the variable and does an assignment. That's an assigning statement, and it assigns one to red automatically. Nothing else in the language works that, like that. It breaks not only our mental models, it breaks all of our lint tools that would flag this as an error. Fortunately, the uh, dev who put this in saw the light and uh, reverted it uh, last night. If you would like to join our world, you need to be the kind of person who doesn't just say, oh, that's cool, let's put it in, and actually thinks about this at some depth, that it's uh, impact on the rest of the world, and it's uh, harmony with the rest of the universe. And I think if you can train yourself to see what's wrong with that, and to argue against it, and to preserve the harmony of Python, I would love to have you as a core dev. Fair enough? All right, questions, suggestions, comments, or complaints? Yes? I was wondering about the code review process. This, she was asking uh, a question I didn't really understand. She said, I want to know about the code review. And she said some word. It sounded vaguely like the word process. I have no idea what that word means. <laughs> we are not a company. We're a group of volunteers. 
We are a ragtag group of people, some of whom who have no job. Some people uh, learned a little Python and wanted to contribute to the uh, core. We, our problem is the more process that you layer on, the more you disincentivize people to volunteer their uh, time to uh, uh, go through. We want to have code review, but how do you review code that you don't understand or it's not in your area of uh, interest? Uh, someone comes in and makes some sophisticated adjustments to XML module. I don't know how to review that without studying the XML spec. So we do have a, a code review, but I would hesitate to call it a process. It is a very haphazard thing. If you're interested in something, a patch goes up, and you have something you can say about it useful. In general, we do. Uh, it's hard to have a more disciplined process than that because people have very, very different talent sets, different time availabilities, different levels of uh, interest. And even Quido himself is only interested in tiny uh, subsets of the language. Excellent question. Five bucks. Thank you, Ashwini. <laughs> One more? Yes. I assume you're obviously very still active in core development. What yes. are some of the pro problems that you are facing right now with core development? Uh, with the core development process or with the, uh, like with the, with the our, our problems that we're actually working on in terms of implementing new features and whatnot? Yes, second uh, one. Uh, so I tried to put some of the uh, problems up here that we could work on. Uh, one of them that I'm working on right now is the design of a rated, weighted random choice. I've sent emails to several applied mathematicians and data scientists trying to get their suggestions in for the design. I've asked all of you to participate and that's how I'm uh, approaching that design problem. A problem we have right now is the compact dict. There's a patch ready to go, and no one has a week and a half of their life to devote to making sure it's correct before it goes in. These are the real problems that we have. Uh, I like to call them the Star Trek problems. Any of you ever are fans of the old Star Trek? What was the theme of every other episode? Not enough time, not enough power. It'll take 10 days to make it Starbase 4. We have to make it in two or someone dies. I need 190% power right now. The engines cannot take no more. We are bandwidth limited in the amount of time that we have to contribute uh, 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 to Python. All of us would like to have more hours in the day to contribute. We don't have enough. Hence the call, we're hiring. OK, and one last question, and then we'll call it a done deal, and we will have the room completely vacated by 11. Yeah. We're starting to vacate in about five minutes. Hey, Raymond. I've, I'm Great. feeling free to trample on the accomplished organizers a little bit because they gave me uh, this big block of time and then took 12 minutes right at the beginning of the talk talking about logistics. So. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, one more, any more questions? <laughs> Not from you? Carol. Hi, Raymond. Um, great talk. And how do you believe we could get more of these critical thinking ideas into the core development world, but from individuals that aren't currently core developers, but might have a lot of product, I mean, uh, we're real world experience in certain areas? This is a fantastic question. Let me rephrase the question. Another way to ask that question is, Raymond, what was this entire talk all about? I'm inviting you into our world. I want you to help on these problems. I just put a list of them up that all of you could start working on right now if you wanted to. You don't have to know the CPython core in order to do it. The compact dict, yes, but several of the other things I listed, you could work on right now. When I said we're hiring, it was funny, but it's true. Come join us. Contribute now. <laughs> Excellent question. 25 bucks. I do. OK. Yes, Anna. Just so you know, uh, my first contribution was actually saying, uh, I'm sorry, but the fact that tells people how to figure out why their float division is going wrong has the wrong question on it because anyone who understands what a float is won't need to ask this question. <laughs> so 
you don't have to have the answer to contribute. You just have to have the question about the part of Python that you are using right now and say, this is a pain point, please help. And that gives the real world use case so they know how to fix it. 15 bucks. <laughs> the, it's a little Star Trek. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. That is not what Spock said. He said the opposite. The needs of the many, the users, outweigh the needs of the uh, standard library itself. That the people who are core devs actually have far different needs than most normal people. We don't think about the problems the same way. We don't tend to even have the same problems that normal folks do, which means we are in dire need of normal people. If you were a normal person, you can do what Anna did and say a normal person would not even know how to phrase that question. Here's the problem they would have that would lead you to the uh, uh, fact entry. So in fact, that is the case. Uh, since I have a couple more minutes, things uh, when you uh, come, come to uh, uh, Python and want to help, stay true to a module's original purpose. The decimal module had one purpose, and it was not computing decimals. The decimal module had one purpose, and that was to implement the decimal arithmetic specification exactly, no more or no less, so that we could port Python code from Python back and forth between other languages that were spec compliant. So should you come to the uh, decimal module and make it easier to use? No, you're varying from the uh, spec. That would be a terrible thing to do. It's a test question. Should you come to the decimal module and say, oh, I have an idea for a brand new method? You're going toe to toe with a committee that spent 15 years and had people from many companies and many researchers and academians and papers written about what the proper API was. The first idea that pops into your mind is probably something they disregarded 15 years ago. Fair enough? So if you come to the decimal module, there's lots of ways to want to help that would make it uh, worse. Really, if you come to the decimal module, the most helpful thing you can say is, you did something here that was not in compliance with the spec, in which case we will fix it uh, instantly. Also, I think this is fairly important, uh, and it applies broadly in the uh, Python world, so I, I want this to be a major message. If you want something to be successful, you don't have to make something else unsuccessful. Does that seem obvious? It does, but human nature is to do exactly the opposite. Do you think I want Python 3 to be successful? I've devoted almost every evening for the past seven years trying to make Python 3 better. Do you think I want Python 3 to be uh, successful? Yeah. yeah. So in order to achieve that, do you think I feel a strong temptation uh, every day to go out and tell people how much Python 2 sucks? <laughs> to, there is an uh, urge within the uh, core developer community it was not shared by me, and thank goodness Quito stepped on it, but a fair number of people wanted to cripple Python 2.7 in some way in order to force users to adopt. It's like, force users to do, we serve users. We don't force users. Users get to make their own uh, choice. If they want to stay on 2.7, they can. Uh, and if they elect to do so, we'll support it in uh, perpetuity. You know, 2020 deadline uh, uh, is, will be real if everybody switches over. If it doesn't, we'll support it uh, forever. You don't have to kill something. An example of this in the uh, Python core is a number of people were very excited about concurrent futures. They think concurrent futures was the future of concurrency, literally. <laughs> and what some of those people did was crippled and uh, closed a lot of the feature requests and bug fixes uh, uh, requests, uh, tracker items for threads and the multiprocessing module. Like, oh, that's so old school. We shouldn't even make those things better because people would, want, would continue to use them and want to. But you don't want us to fix a bug as a way to punch somebody in the nose and make them use concurrent futures because you're going to decide for them without knowing their use case in advance what is the right thing for them? No. If we put it in the standard library, once it's in, it's our job to make it good, even if there's two competing uh, paths of development. So, this is advice for life, but it is all big projects. When you get there, you're going to champion something, and you're going to have an urge to rip something else apart in order to make your thing uh, 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 better. I see it all the time. We have uh, type simple, uh, or simple namespace, which is kind of cool. It's underutilized. Lots of people don't know about it or like it. So the person who was the biggest champion of it went to the name tuple documentation and basically turned all of the name tuple documentation to what you really want is simple type namespace. 
In other words, making that documentation less usable for the people who uh, wanted to actually look up what name tuples actually do. And this is human nature. There's nothing wrong with that person. I'm just asking you to recognize that's your nature and to stop uh, uh, doing such things. This is advice on how to be usually contribute to uh, uh, open source projects. Uh, this was the example I was looking at before, looking for earlier. I knew there was a slide for it. Here's what the old code was. Here's what the new code is. Once you know what this old code does, I'm testing this operator to make sure that operator works with sets for a subtest test. This change is nonsensical. This change is checked in, along with several thousand others that are uh, just like it. So uh, a note on unit test uh, being sacred, I haven't heard these thoughts anywhere else before, so I really want to get this out now because it affects you outside of uh, the Python world. It affects you in your own project. Why do you have tests? One of the great things is as you refactor your code, you've got a safety net, and you know as you've changed the code that you haven't broken it. Does that sound useful? Yes. Would you want to refactor code that didn't have a uh, safety net? No. But there is code that doesn't have a safety net. What is it? Right. It's the test itself, which means if somebody sets out to refactor the test, the test can possibly stop testing what they were supposed to test for. And you would never know. So I think this, because it has no defense, that these are sacred. For the most part, don't go refactoring people's tests. It does not make uh, code better. In particular, uh, not everybody practices test-driven development. I do it once in a while when it's convenient for a particular project. But when you do, it's awesome. Because the test you wrote has a virtue that no other test had. When you wrote it, it failed. Then you wrote code to make it turn green. That tells me that the test actually works. Rock climbers have safety ropes. They also put weight on the safety rope to make sure that it's actually going to work. A bunch of tests that are written after the fact, have the test itself hasn't been tested to make sure that it actually catches uh, anything. So any tests written this way are sacred. And if you change them later, you've undermined something that we will never get back. Likewise, a regression test. Uh, we had a bug report. We put in a test for it. That test failed at one point and then succeeded. If you go rearrange and refactor those tests, you've mucked it all up. And also, tests tend to reflect how the author thinks about how the code is supposed to be used. It's a pattern of thinking. And were you to go rewrite all of those things, you've destroyed the pattern of uh, uh, thinking. Do I highly recommend going to refactor tests? No. no, go make new tests. Do not destroy old tests. They're sacred. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for inviting me to uh, Pi Bay. Come join me as a Python core developer.